Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode 13 of my series on the Mexican Revolution, President Alvaro Obregón. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained last episode, Felix Diaz had seized control of Veracruz in 1917 and briefly became the leading rebel. But he failed to forge alliances with rebels in other regions. Zapata's position in Morelos had weakened steadily until he was lured into an ambush and killed on April 9, 1919. While Villa managed to avoid capture, his increasing brutality ended any hope of building a real army, driving away his best general, Felipe Ángeles, who was captured and executed. Faced with several small-scale revolts that lacked national leadership, Carranza appeared to be the unchallenged leader of Mexico, except he had little real support and he made a fatal error when he arrested Obregón to prevent him from winning the upcoming 1920 presidential election. Obregón escaped and won the support of most of the army as well as the Zapatistas, Sedlistas, Villistas, and Felicistas. Carranza fled to Veracruz, planning to go into exile, but the route was blocked and he died trying to escape. Carranza's victory over Villa during the Civil War following the defeat of Victoriano Huerta had really been the victory of the Sonoran faction over the Villistas. Instead of recognizing his dependence on Obregón, Carranza had rashly pushed a showdown with the Sonoran faction, which resulted in his death and their complete takeover of the government. With Carranza dead, interim president Adolfo de la Huerta negotiated with the remaining factions to try to finally end the fighting. Realizing that Obregón was a much more dangerous opponent than Carranza, Felix Diaz surrendered and returned to exile. His departure indicated the end of the Porfirians as a force in Mexico. In exchange for supporting Obregón, Manuel Pelez was made military commander of the oil zone, although he failed to become governor of Veracruz. In September 1920, Pelez left to receive medical treatment in the U.S., but when another general revolted in his territory, Obregón concluded that he had failed to fulfill his part of the arrangement, namely, ensure stability in a vital region, so Pelez once again accepted exile in the U.S. The Zapatistas should have proven more difficult since they had revolted against Porfiro Diaz and then continued their revolt through the regimes of Francisco Madero, Victoriano Huerta, and Venustiano Carranza. However, Zapata was dead and his successor, Gildardo Magana, had conspired with Obregón to overthrow Carranza. The surviving Zapatistas were permitted to re-enter the political process, gaining control of the key government positions in Morelos and the Federal Department of Agriculture. Although the federal government's new land decrees fell far short of those introduced when Zapata had firm control of the state, they were much better than anything introduced during the regimes of Diaz, Madero, Huerta, and Carranza. In San Luis Potosi, Obregón cooperated with Saturnino Cedillo, who offered solid support in exchange for land and schools for his followers. Having lost three of his brothers to the revolution, Cedillo was probably happy to try peace. Unlike other leaders who wanted political power or wealth, Cedillo knew that he had achieved the upward social mobility that had motivated his family to join Madero's revolt, and he had been able to obtain land for his men, who were former sharecroppers or peons on haciendas. Only Villa was left, and he was a much bigger challenge. De La Huerta was willing to pardon him, but Obregón refused to permit negotiations. Resolving to show the consequences of ignoring his offer of peace, Villa led his remaining followers on a nightmarish crossing of the 700-mile-wide desert between Chihuahua and Coahuila to show that he was still a threat. It succeeded. Obregón concluded that the personal satisfaction of seeing Villa standing in front of a firing squad was not worth the danger of American investors panicking and pulling their money out of Coahuila. So he finally guaranteed that as president, he would not renew the hunt for Villa. When Villa and his 759 men officially surrendered their weapons, it signaled the end of the revolution while Obregón's landslide victory in the September 1920 presidential election marked a new era. The death toll during the 10 years of the revolution is estimated 
to be between 500,000 and a million people, in addition to the 300,000 killed by the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. The revolt against Carranza had been surprisingly brief, so it had caused relatively little damage, while Obregón's firm grip on the army enabled his government to continue rebuilding Mexico's infrastructure. De La Huerta deserves a lot of credit for his hard work as interim president, since he ensured that Obregón could start his presidency in a peaceful Mexico. The first occupant of the presidential chair in such a situation since Diaz was overthrown. So, the question is... How exactly would Obregón govern? In particular, how would he deal with land reform, one of the factors that had fueled the initial revolution against Porfirio Díaz? Article 27 of the Constitution gave state governors control over land reform. Governors who wanted to build up local support might choose to allow land distribution, but governors who allied with hacendados could ignore land reform. On the surface, Allowing local governments to determine which approach best satisfied local needs sounds like smart policy, but in practice, Obregón was either gambling that most governors would have sufficient common sense to avoid provoking more peasant revolts, or he did not care, believing that he could crush any peasant revolts. In the end, Obregón's commitment to land reform was limited at best, since 114 families owned 25% of the land in 1923. The primary change that resulted from the process was the expansion of the civilian bureaucracy, since civilian governors and the National Agrarian Commission were in charge of land reform. Admittedly, there were radical governors such as Francisco Mujica in Michoacan, but cooperation between the various agrarian movements was difficult since Michoacan was separated from Morelos and San Luis Potosi by other states. To be fair, Obregón did invest heavily in rural education, building thousands of schools to fight illiteracy since most of the population was illiterate when he took office. Having allied with the Crom Union against Carranza, Obregón proved more supportive of labor, ensuring that laborers in large cities had Sunday off with pay and had the right to strike. However, this support had limits. Any crush strikes organized by non-crom unions, especially railroad workers, viewing them as challenges to his authority. As president, Obregón filled his cabinet with Sonorans. De La Huerta became head of the treasury, Plutarco Elias Calles was interior minister, and Benjamin Hill was minister of war, but they did not always agree with each other or with Obregón. In fact, Calles and Hill were the two leading candidates to succeed Obregón when his term ended, so a fair amount of friction was to be expected. Instead, the rivalry became deadly. While Obregón was less autocratic than Carranza, he was no believer in democracy. Benjamin Hill was closely allied with the middle-class PLC, the Liberal Constitutionalist Party, the largest party in the legislature, which wanted a true parliamentary democracy. However, Obregón and Calles were impatient with the democratic process and viewed the PLC as dangerous opponents, not competitors for votes. The struggle against the PLC may have involved assassination, since both Hill and PLC President José Novello became seriously ill following a banquet held by Obregón. Novello recovered, but Hill died on December 14, 1920. Clearly, the military thought that their leader had been assassinated, since several generals, including Francisco Murguía and Lucio Blanco, rebelled a month later. But they lost and fled to the U.S. Blanco would be assassinated in June 1922, and Murguía died in another revolt later that year. Despite Obregón's landslide election victory, President Woodrow Wilson refused to recognize the new administration since it had seized power, so the Mexican government could not obtain loans from American banks. Loans were needed to rebuild Mexico since Obregón had the bad luck to take office during the post-World War I recession when demand for Mexico's minerals and metals plummeted. In particular, the value of silver and copper exports had plunged by half between 1920 and 1921. However, recognition depended on the Mexican government paying off its foreign debts and allowing foreign companies to drill for oil. The key issue was Article 27 of the 1917 Constitution, which stated that subsoil rights, specifically petroleum and all hydrocarbons, were held in direct dominion by the Mexican state. 
the oil companies were vehemently opposed to Article 27. Having operated autonomously during the revolution, oil companies were unconcerned about the rest of Mexico, just the oil-producing region of Veracruz and Tampico. In fact, the oil industry had thrived despite the revolution. Mexico's share of global oil production had risen from 1% in 1910 to 23% in 1920. And the oil producers had little interest in sharing their profits with the Mexican government. Despite the fears of American oil producers, the Mexican Revolution was not influenced by the Russian Revolution. However, Mexicans were well aware that nearby Cuba had been occupied by the U.S., which had forced the Cubans to include in their constitution a statement giving the U.S. veto power over its foreign relations and public finances and the right to intervene at will. So Mexican suspicions of American intentions were understandable. In fact, Theodore Roosevelt had claimed in 1916 that the U.S. should handle Mexico the same way it had handled Cuba, while Henry Cabot Lodge, Republican chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs, was a firm advocate of applying the Cuban approach to Mexico. American oil producers had good connections to the government since both Franklin Lane, Wilson's Secretary of the Interior, and William McAdoo, his son-in-law, were employed by oil tycoon Edward Doheny. To the disappointment of the oilmen, Wilson refused to greenlight an invasion of Mexico, believing it would be a blatant attempt to gain control of its oil, which is good, but odd, given his previous two, I repeat, two invasions. In January 1921, Obregón announced that only companies which had complied with Carranza's earlier decrees would receive drilling concessions. A decree on May 24th announced a 10% tax on oil production and introduced an export tax on June 7th. Most American oil producers cut off production on July 1st in protest. Seven weeks later, they sent five heads of companies to negotiate with Obregón, who agreed that Article 27 would not be applied retroactively, but export taxes would go up if not as much. While the increase in export taxes was not heavy, Any increase was a worrying sign. Concluding that Wilson did not prioritize their interests, Edward Doheny and other petroleum producers worked with numerous business groups to ensure the election of a business-friendly candidate, Warren Harding, as the Republican nominee for president. Still, there was no guarantee that he would win the election, especially if the Democrats nominated a strong candidate. Fortunately for Harding and his businessmen backers, the Democrats were far from united. During the Democratic Convention, delegates were deadlocked. Governor James Cox of Ohio was leading former Treasury Secretary McAdoo with Attorney General Alexander Palmer a distant third, but Wilson refused to endorse any of them. Instead, he seemed open to being drafted for a third term, even though he was still recovering from a stroke and had been unable to work for a couple of months, which had been concealed from the American public. Although Cox finally won the 44th ballot, his victory seemed to be due to delegate exhaustion rather than any real enthusiasm. Wilson was still too weak to campaign for him and had wasted too much political capital on the failed attempt to ensure the ratification of the Treaty of Versailles while the nation was in the mood for a change, so Harding won in a landslide. Harding repaid his backers with the appointment of Senator Albert Fall as Secretary of the Interior. In fact, the cabinet became known as the Oil Cabinet. Banker and part owner of Gulf Oil Andrew Mellon was appointed Secretary of the Treasury. Sinclair Oil Director Theodore Roosevelt Jr. was made Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And Sinclair Attorney William Hayes became Postmaster General. The makeup of the new cabinet was not welcome news to the Mexican government. To be fair, Harding did not want an invasion, but he would not recognize Obregón's administration until American property and subsoil rights were handled to American satisfaction. Recognition was not critical, but access to American capital was very, very important since Obregón wanted foreign loans to bankroll his plans for agrarian reform and development. Unknown to Obregón, the business community in the U.S. was divided. While the oil interests represented by Fall wanted to delay recognition to obtain better terms, the bankers wanted recognition now to begin lending Mexico money, which would be profitable now. 
Thomas Lamont, a senior executive with J.P. Morgan, headed an international banking committee that arranged meetings between Mexican ministers and American lenders in New York City. Recognizing that pressing for full repayment of debts was likely to lead to another revolution, Lamont privately advocated cancelling half of the back interest on debts and refunding what was left in a new loan but took a harder line in public to encourage negotiations. Arriving in New York in the summer of 1922, the Mexican delegation was led by Minister of Finance Adolfo de la Huerta. Despite the title of his position, de la Huerta was inexperienced with financial matters and had trouble understanding the complex terms involved in the negotiations, so he relied heavily on Lamont's advice. Obregón wanted recognition and new foreign loans, but an eager-to-please de la Huerta stated that he did not want new money and agreed that all revenue from oil and export taxes would be used to repay the existing foreign debt. Despite reminders from Obregón, de la Huerta refused to bring up the topic of new loans. Eventually, de la Huerta returned to Mexico with no new loans, an unfavorable agreement with Mexico's creditors, and no recognition. But Obregón signed the agreement despite his misgivings, fearing worse relations with the U.S. and Europe. Clearly, de la Huerta was not a good negotiator. The situation changed dramatically following the teapot dome scandal. The oil industry was booming after the war, so there was fierce competition for new untapped drilling sites, especially the Naval Petroleum Reserves, fields deliberately left untapped as a reserve for the Navy to prevent wartime fuel shortages. Two of the reserves were located in California, and the third reserve was the Teapot Dome in Wyoming, named after a rock formation that resembled a teapot. Aware that a smart but morally flexible oil producer could simply lease land near the reserves and drill at an angle to suck the reserve dry, Wilson's Navy secretary had won permission to lease parts of the lands to allow a trustworthy company to drain limited amounts. After Harding won election, authority for the fields was transferred to Albert Fall, the Secretary of the Interior. Doheny won drilling rights of the reserve, and he also loaned Fall $100,000. The two men were old friends, so it may not have been intended as a bribe, since Fall was deep in debt and he accepted an even larger gift from Sinclair Oil. The cozy deal became public when an angry oil man sent a letter to his senator criticizing the situation, and the senator sent a formal letter to Fall asking for a statement of facts about the teapot transaction. Fall was forced to resign, but neither his resignation nor Harding's surprise death from a heart attack on August 2, 1923 would stop the investigation. Doheny believed that he had done nothing wrong, so he told the truth about the loan to Fall, including his observation that a loan of $100,000 for him was equivalent to a loan of $50 by an ordinary person, although he did admit that it was probably a large sum to Fall. The situation escalated until both the Secretary of the Navy and the Attorney General had resigned. Worse, Doheny, his son, and Sinclair were all indicted on bribery charges. So there would be a new president and a radically different cabinet, making Obregón's life much easier. However, a much more serious problem would be the presidential succession, which would prove to be very bloody and unsurprisingly involve Pancho Villa. To sum up, following Obregón's victory over Carranza, all of the various rebel groups negotiated surrender in exchange for amnesty, even Pancho Villa, ending the revolution after 10 blood-soaked years. Aside from the challenge of rebuilding Mexico, Obregón had to deal with the American refusal to recognize his government. I will discuss the struggle to determine Obregón's successor next episode. Thanks for listening.